Good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Welcome to the first history and theory of new media lecture of the semester. My name is Camille Crittenden. I'm a member of the BCNM Executive Committee and Executive Director of Citrus, which is the Center for IT Research in the Interest of Society. Today's event is presented by the Berkeley Center for New Media, an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emergence from diverse perspectives. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for the evening. I'm very pleased on behalf of Citrus uh, to be a co-sponsor, the School of Information, American Cultures, and the Center for Race and Gender. And before all of our events, we provide a land acknowledgement, which is especially uh, appropriate tonight um, when we're talking about indigenous technologies. So I'll um, share the, uh, the information about the land acknowledgement here. We recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of Chechenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the Confederated Villages of Lishan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land, and all of our technological infrastructures and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We commit to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place by the Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationship with tribal leaders and organizations. Tonight's event is part of BCNM's Indigenous Technologies Program, which engages questions of technology and new media in relation to global structures of indigeneity, settler colonialism, and genocide in the 21st century. Our Indigenous tech events and ongoing conversations with Indigenous scholars and communities aim to critically envision and reimagine what a more just and sustainable technological future can look like. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Beth Piatote, who will moderate the conversation with our featured speaker, Marissa Duarte. Beth Piatote is a scholar of Native American and Indigenous literature and law a creative writer of fiction, poetry, plays, and essays, and an indigenous language revitalization activist and healer specializing in Nez Perce language and literature. She's the author of two books, Domestic Subjects, Gender, Citizenship, and Law in Native American Literature, published by Yale in 2013, which won an MLA award, and The Bead Workers, Stories, published by Counterpoint in 2019, which was long listed for the Aspen Words Literary Prize, the Penn Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction, and shortlisted for the California Independent Booksellers Association Golden Poppy Award. Her current projects include a series of scholarly essays on indigenous law through sensory representations of sound, vision, synesthesia, and haunting in 20th century literary works. Essays on indigenous language revitalization, a novel, a poetry collection, and further development of her play Antigone, which was selected for the 2020 Festival of New Plays at the Autry. So Beth is a very busy person, and we're pleased that she can join us here tonight. Welcome, Beth. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Berkeley Center for New Media and all the co-sponsors for this wonderful opportunity to introduce Professor Duarte and to be on this program centered on indigenous technologies. It's truly an honor to hear her speak and to be in conversation with her and with everyone who's gathered here in our meeting place tonight. Marissa Elena Duarte is a member of the Pascoyaki tribe and is also related to the Mexican American families in the city of South Tucson. She is an assistant professor of justice and social inquiry through the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. She researches information, knowledge, and technology in the context of indigeneity. Her 2017 book, Network Sovereignty, Building the Internet Across Indian Country, investigates the relationship between sovereignty and the tribal command of internet infrastructures. Her most recent work is on indigenous feminist approaches to social media. Welcome, Professor Duarte. Thank you. We didn't get to mention, but I get to work with um, Beth at least once every couple of weeks because we both um, 
do a lot of um, leadership level work with the Native American and um, Indigenous Studies Association. So I was super excited when I found out that, you know, we get to have a conversation today um, around some of the stuff that I, I, I work on, you know. Um, so I'm happy to share with you today my work on Indigenous cyber relationality. Um, I am going to uh, just let you know that in about that about the first in the first five minutes of the talk, I am going to describe an incidence of sexual assault. And so um, and after that, you know, um, we are going to the talk is organized around um, the nature of crime that occurs against Native and Indigenous people, but that it occurs at about the five minute mark. So I just want you to know about it. And I also want to encourage those of you who, um, you know, we deal with this in our lives to um, let's just take a moment to appreciate that I am here today in the interest of, um, of healing, in the interest of connecting creatively and of honoring our shared intelligence as native and indigenous thinkers and as thinkers who stand in solidarity with the plight of those who struggle. And so with that energy, I hope that we can move through these moments um, to appreciate how Native peoples use social media to connect. So I am going to go ahead and shift over. I'm going to just share my slides. So let's, let's bring that up. All right. Okay, and I think, um, can you all see that? Do I need to stop my video? I think I'll I'll stop my video and I might um, pop in and out just a, just a bit here and there. All right. So this talk is about discerning the limits and potential for connective action. And you know, over the years, I have studied, analyzed, observed, and been a part of efforts to digitize indigenous knowledge, advocate for internet infrastructure for native peoples, and deploy learning technologies in native contexts. As alongside the work that I already do, you know, I've been doing for a long time as far as advocating for Native people's rights. And through these experiences, I've identified features that I call Indigenous cyber relationality. And that is how Native peoples carry protocols of respect, belonging, kinship, and shared purpose through digital spheres toward connective action. So to perceive Indigenous cyber relationality is also to perceive what it is intended to prevent. And that's colonization through acts of surveillance, voyeurism, agent provocateurs, cyber stalking, symbolic violence, physical violence, loss of ancestral ways of knowing, and disinformation. So I'm going to begin this presentation with the phenomena of pretendianism as it emerges through digital platforms, because it shows why Indigenous peoples practice cyber relationality. And I will also share examples of how different communities of practice within Indian country practice cyber relationality. And finally, I'm going to um, close with some notes on how this relates to self-determination. So first, I want to make sure to update everyone on some pertinent background knowledge. Um, I believe we have a fairly mixed group attending this session. So um, I, I want to first you know, let you know that during this talk, I'm going to reference at least two social movements integral to digital activism in Indian country. And the first is Idle No More, a social movement initiated by three First Nations women and an ally north of the medicine line in Ontario, Canada, I believe is on, I might have that wrong. Oh my, okay, north of the medicine line. It sort of occurred all through the border of the north of US and Canada. In 2012, Canadian Prime Minister Harper initiated a series of acts violating First Nation sovereignty to clear the way for transnational oil pipelines. And the Idle No More movement is notable for influencing transnational resistance against those decisions. The second movement that I'm going to mention in this talk is No DAPL or um, No Dakota uh, Access Pipeline. And this was a social movement initiated largely by Lakota, Dakota, and Lakota youth activists and indigenous environmentalists in solidarity with the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. In 2016, Energy Transfer Partners initiated legal construction of an oil pipeline in North Dakota and through the ancestral lands of the tribe. And this movement, No DAPL, is notable for the amount of indigenous peoples and nations who travel to the area to prevent illegal drilling as well as the amount of state surveillance and FBI infiltration resulting in unjust incrimination of activists, journalists, and native peoples. So this image here you see is uh, from um, act, uh, frontline action at, um, at the water protector camps around Nodapal. So th during this talk, I also lean on the concept of connective action. And this, has large, this concept has largely been advanced since 2010, primarily by communication scholars Lance Bennett and Andrea Segerberg 
as they analyze direct action and social media traces associated with the Arab Spring. So connective action is when multiple individuals and groups act in solidarity, even though they may have perhaps only ever met or connected online. It contrasts theories of collective action in which individuals and groups who know each other coordinate through face-to-face -face engagement and through large institutions like say the Sierra Club or the ACLU. Connective action is far more diffuse and agile and social power is distributed across a range of actors that includes the affordances of digital devices and platforms. So you can study connective action quantitatively through social network analysis and uh, qualitatively through observations, interviews and so forth. And finally, I remind the audience that native peoples in the US comprise a small portion of the population yet command a significant portion of land and natural resources and also negotiate with the federal government on a nation to nation basis across over 568 federally recognized native nations. There are many indigenous peoples in the US and across North America who are not enrolled in a tribe, but who often stand in solidarity with native peoples and nations. Each nation has its own pre-European indigenous language, philosophies, religious practices, ceremonial cycle, territory, histories, and kinship networks. And so while our tribal governments are legally sovereign, the peoples therein define their inherent sovereignty. It's sort of like pre, it prefigures or coincides with legal sovereignty. So in this talk, I characterize inherent sovereignty with regard to indigenous ways of being and knowing, as well as the political will of the people. So I'm gonna start talking about uh, digital pretendianism. Um, on Saturday, August 1st, 2020, some professors gathered through Zoom to honor the memory of Aleppo, an ASU anthropologist, Hopi tribal member, and outspoken feminist. A few awkward moments caused the attending to realize that the deceased never lived. The host of the memorial service, a former Vanderbilt University professor and leader in hashtag MeTooSTEM, had invented Aleppo through a Twitter account attributed to at sciencingby. So professors who had worked with this individual, here's a picture, um, Dr. Beth McLaughlin, found her behaviors controlling and toxic. And within a few days of Aleppo's imaginary death by COVID-19, journalists revealed Dr. McLaughlin to be a digital pretendian. That is a non-native person who creates a Native American social media persona for profit and psychological gain. So um, I am a professor at ASU, I'm a native professor at ASU. And so after Dr. McLaughlin tweeted about the death of Aleppo, a few students reached out asking if I knew the deceased. And even though ASU boasts over 4,800 professors, we can probably fit every native professor into a 50 person room and we all know each other. My colleague, Professor Angela Gonzalez is Hopi and a sociologist, but is alive and at the time, was taking on an extraordinary um, amount of work, extra leadership roles within our school. A few reporters reached out to me as well, asking if I knew the deceased, and I let them know, you know, um, this is what pretendianism does, right? It's exploitative, it's fraudulent, and it's psychologically exhausting. For those of us who are who we say we are in Indian country and who do what we say we are going to do, and yet who, in spite of our inexhaustible integrity, face discrimination. Now, pretendianism is one aspect of contemporary colonial exploitation of Native and Indigenous peoples. It obscures what it means to be Native American. To be Native American is to belong to an inherently sovereign and self-governing people that collectively recognize and rely on their kin toward epistemic, political, social, and territorial continuity. It is not really a racial construct, though the U.S. system of race and caste makes it seem that way. And this is why it's insufficient for people who have some genetic trace of non-European indigenous ancestry, but no tribal belonging to propel themselves as Native Americans. That is if their tribe does not claim them. So sadly, often the worst perpetrators associated with pretendianism are also associated with fraudulent, if not criminal activities. And this is, this is the, the trigger warning that I indicated earlier. Um, in 2016, Red Wolf Pope made a name for himself as a highly visible advocate of the No Dapple movement. And he, in 2018, Santa Fe jurors found Pope guilty of rape and voyeurism. He had drugged women and recorded himself raping her. Pope's former housemate turned over to Seattle police devices containing recordings of Pope having intercourse with women, some allegedly consensual and some not, including non-consensual recordings of a housemate showering. A major part of Red Wolf's guile was his claim to traditional tribal belonging specifically to Lalip and Western Shoshone, neither of which had record of his enrollment. And 
you can see sort of that um, topmost image. That is a picture of Red Wolf there, and I be I'm not. I believe that photo might have been taken at. Um, not too sure, but it might have been taken around in Idle No More March. Um, so, so sometimes these pretendian performances are not physically violent, but they are nevertheless fraudulent. So on December 10th, 2020, Rulan Tangan, a noted Filipina American choreographer for Dancing Earth Productions, confessed to not being a tribally enrolled Native American and to utilizing relationships with tribal families and Native artists as her rationale for claiming funds and programming opportunities designed for enrolled Native artists. Decolonial Filipino scholars have also challenged Rulan's claim to Filipino indigeneity. And this brings up discussions in the broader global indigenous community about kinship and accountability across Oceania and how it laps against the political hierarchies of US sovereignty, including US tribal sovereignty. So those are images of Rulan in the bottom, uh, the bottom corner of your screen. So all of these forms of pretendianism indicate features of anti-Indian informatic violence. And I want to be clear, right? The things that Red Wolf did are not the same level of wrongdoing as the things that Beth Ann McLaughlin did, or even Rulon sort of, you know, use claiming appropriation of funds um, uh, intentionally designated for Native artists. You know, these are not the same level of wrongdoing. It's not the same of bodily harm, not same level of bodily harm. It's not the same level of psychological harm and so forth. But these cases share a common root. The accused leverage exoticized representations of Native Americans toward gains in their careers and in their psychological sense of self. They rely on the connective power of social media to boost these representations. And these cases indicate the psychosocial landscape in which Native peoples persist. So for those affected by the wrongdoing of these individuals, there is no border wall between the flesh, the mind, settler sovereign political will and the spirit of the machine that makes these acts possible. There is only the experience of being violated, which for native peoples is merged with the experience of subjugation and pulls at the weft of the historical trauma into which we are born. For us, the colonial logics of white supremacy that allow rape, voyeurism, and theft of Native people's belongings and ways of knowing are endemic, felt, and apparent. However, even though we've grown up with this, it took a mob of overt white supremacists seizing the US Capitol building on January 6, 2021 for the big tech companies, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, and others, to take a stand against radical white supremacist uses of their social media platforms. Amazon removed Parler, Twitter permanently blocked Trump's user account. But I, I believe that it, they might, there might be some sort of discussions now that he's a private citizen. Uh, for at least a decade, many different groups in the US and beyond have challenged Facebook's misuse of personal user data as a breach of privacy. And after Trump's unethical 2016 election to the presidency, only due to a series of congressional inquiries, lawsuits, and allegations from election meddling to surveillance to censorship, Facebook leadership has finally somewhat agreed they have a white supremacist problem built into the flesh that codes, buys the products, and generates enticing content, including content inciting violence against dark-skinned people. So has the kingdom of technocrats finally realized there is no border wall between the flesh, the mind, the sovereign political will, and the spirit of the machine? For those routinely violated by the colonial spirit of the machine, it is the era of dark matter and black and indigenous intellectuals know that by dark, we're not referring to immeasurable quanta shaping the fabric of space time, but rather the realization of capital B blackness and capital I indigeneity. Those who are hyper surveilled yet voiceless. Those who are criminalized for the color of their skin yet subjugated for the beauty of their minds. Those who are desired yet hated those who are expected to shoulder the violent tensions within a caste system that insists on border walls, prisons, hoods, ghettos, barrios, reservations, and other infrastructures of spatial, social, and epistemic segregation. So nevertheless, despite the colonial entanglements of the social media giants, native peoples connect with each other, mobilize, and indigenize social networking sites by practicing cyber relationality. So taking a closer look at how this occurs reveals aspects related to quality of life amid platform capitalism, in particular around privacy, self-determination, and political will. And I'd like to give some clear examples across the informatic agendas of five communities of practice, if I may, in Indian country. So these are grassroots activists, tribal elders, 
cultural knowledge keepers, policy advocates, and IT professionals, information technology professionals. So what do grassroots activists say about this? Through Idle No More, First Nations and Native American activists, primarily women and mothers, utilize the affordances of social media and instant messaging to organize against the injustice. Organizers generated the hashtag Idle No More to indicate how, as indigenous peoples, they would command an active resistance to Canadian environmental destruction through flash mobs, prayer rallies, marches, teach-ins, and for Ottawa Piscot leader Teresa Spence, a hunger strike. In retrospect, years after, Anishinaabe scholar Leanne Simpson expressed doubt about the disembodied connective action that emerged through the movement. She questioned how a movement grounded in an indigenous matrilineal care for environment and in turn care for a people's future well being could be sustained through a loose agglomeration of network actors who never met each other and who perhaps had no apparent responsibilities to care for First Nations, waterways, lands, animals, or families. Did social media make Idle No More no more than a slogan, instantly gratifying for leftists addicted to the colonial technicization of platform capitalism? Indeed, anarchist agent provocateurs riddled Idle No More marches in major US Canada cities, causing politicians to downplay the legitimacy of First Nations and Native nations. Red Wolf Pope, who I described earlier, gained some notoriety as an activist and tribal traditionalist amid the energy of Idle No More. Simpson asserts that in the US and Canada, indigenous social movements are firstly built on the trust cultivated among matriarchs over generations, expressed through families whose kinship and reciprocity yield a constellated intelligence imbued with the vigor of interpersonal care. So while social media affords activist matriarchs the means for transnational solidarity, the flesh, the spirit, and the political will of indigenous movements are tempered by activists who ask newcomers in online spaces, how do we know each other? How are we related? How are our families related? How do you show care? The moderators of online groups play a key role in deciding who to allow in, how to address comments on posts, and how to enforce group norms. This work requires interpersonal triangulation in which moderators check on the kinship and accountability of newcomers by reaching out to their relatives. This is one way that indigenous social movements deter pretendians agent provocateurs, and the rudeness of leftist settlers who sometimes lack respect for the praxis of indigenous constellated intelligence. So what do tribal elders say about, you know, these uses of social media um, and social um, networking to sort of organize? You know, tribal elders also insist on kinship and interpersonal and environmental reciprocity. So in 2010, when I was living in Tucson, I was uh, working with different you know, elders and people in my family. And I was preparing to write the theory sections on my book on internet infrastructure in Indian country. And at the time I was having many conversations with my friend and colleague, Miranda Bilardi Lewis, who is Zuni and Plinkett about how we noticed our own tribal communities uses of social media and smartphones. So for Miranda and I in our communities, it is simultaneously a cultural behavior, customary law and a policy of the tribes to prevent the use of mobile phones or any recording devices, including sketch pads and photography at meaningful places during our annual ceremonial seasons. So having grown up in these traditions, we know the reasons why. It's to prevent infiltration by anthropologists and amateur ethnographers motivated by personal profit. The impacts of settler ethnography are long-term. I recently re reread a 1933 study by a Texas Tech anthropologist who used photographs and measurements of body shapes, skeletal structure, skin and hair color and facial features to racially categorize my ancestors and Miranda's ancestors as, as respectively Negroid, Mongoloid, or Indian. To this day, amateur researchers wonder at my tribe ceremonies, which they perceive as an exotic syncretic composite of Christianity and some pre-colonial mystery that is haunting and evocative. For many, it is a ceremony of epistemic othering against which to ground their whiteness. So in 2010, I asked a few of my aunts for their opinions on the increasing prevalence of social media and smartphones among young people in the community. And my, uh, my aunt Amalia Reyes spoke about how during ceremonial occasions, the devices are distracting, causing young people's minds to wander and attuning them to artificial time rather than natural cycles. So certain prayers are meant to begin when the sun is at a certain point at the horizon, not necessarily at like, you know, 6 a.m. per se. And all prayers require commitment and attention to the communal self being a part of the chorus of voices, sensing the coolness of the evening breeze, calling to the coyotes or the owls or the rain clouds as they are evoked in songs and marches. So one cannot be yaki, a being calibrated to our desert home while plugged into the showy demands of Facebook or Snapchat. 
So the elders ask of us as we slip into our ways of knowing, how are you contributing? How are you present? They draw our attention to the sensations and experiences of physical territorial belonging through which the spirit of our indigeneity emerges. They ground our sense of humanity in our biome, in our bodies, with our relatives, our communal purpose, and our songs. It prevents us from confusing identity, our identity, with that of our social media personas. Now, what do cultural knowledge keepers have to say about this? So this is not to say that elders are against the uses of digital technologies. My tribe, along with many, share language, history, and news through platforms like YouTube and Facebook. And this is done with regard for the social and economic forces that disperse Native peoples from each other and their territories. Cultural knowledge keepers, including librarians, archivists, language educators, and museum professionals ask, how can we use digital technologies to restore belonging through communal ways of knowing? How can digital archives, memes, micro language lessons, images, songs, and poetry restore our people's sensibility of their indigeneity? And how through the uses of digital collections can native and non-native peoples learn reciprocity? So in 2016, I had the honor of working alongside 25 native librarians, filmmakers, professors, and archivists who asked these questions as they developed the values to infuse the digitization of over 2000 volumes within the Kim Waite Eisenberg Native American Literature Collection at Amherst College. Their solution, build a program of events through which tribal elders and culture keepers can relate the meaning of the digitized documents, sharing that meaning within the long histories of the peoples of the Northeastern Valleys, the common pot. And the commitment essentially of all the people who were there was that it wasn't just sort of the responsibility of Amherst College to do this for everyone. It's essentially the responsibility of every native librarian filmmaker, professor, archivist who works with digitizing knowledge to incorporate that into their practice because we ourselves represent this um, loose network of individuals spread across the United States. So we see this occurring through the work of Abenaki historian Margaret Bruchak and her research team who fused together historical research, repatriation work, story work, and the affordances of Facebook and their blog on the Wampum Trail to teach Native and non-Native people about wampum belts as living documents. Mar Marge Bruchak was actually at that, um, that event that we had in 2016. And I also just wanna um, give a shout out to her book, Savage Kin, which is just a really illuminating um, uh, research work on, on sort of going back into the archives and realizing some of the gender dynamics embedded in those, that, those colonial projects. So what do policy advocates say about these technica, techni technicized uses of information and knowledge about Indian country? So definitely technically savvy indigenous peoples combine the media rich databases of institutional platforms like digital library collections, MOOCs and personal websites with the interoperability of corporate platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, TikTok and Zoom to co-generate asynchronous learning environments. And through these platforms, they raise awareness of global indigenous struggles and participate in connective action toward the real time shaping of political will. So uh, it, this would, would have been around 2018, my research team and I, Morgan Vigil Hayes and, and Nicolette Dashini Parkhurst, observed just that in our social network analysis of over 10,000 tweets associated with 108 Native women political candidates through the 2018 US midterm elections. So we analyzed the tweets associated with two candidates in particular, Deb Holland and Peggy Flanagan, and through that observed the rise of issue groups positioning values of environmental well-being, anti-police brutality, and rights of indigenous women and girls against the overt racist expressions of hashtag MAGA Trump supporters. So we observe the diffusion of misinformation and disinformation associated with white supremacy, racism, and sexism. It was possible to see alliances among diverse issue groups that were sort of coordinating toward a common cause. So we saw groups who were sort of supporting um, uh, um, representation of women, you know, along with indigenous representation of women, along with representation of black women and black women's issues. We saw alliances among groups supporting LGBTQ rights and indigenous women, and we saw alliances among groups representing environmental rights. And then peppered throughout a lot of that were statements against police brutality. So we also noted a tendency among these groups, the ones that were sort of operating against the hashtag MAGA you know, linked affiliated groups, we saw a tendency toward positive messaging, avoidance of fear-based messaging, 
And, and sometimes they would use sort of use the MAGA hashtag in an ironic way in an effort to restore truth and accuracy amid a wave of anti-Indigenous, actually all it's basically racist disinformation. So, so we can observe the rise of data savvy native policy advocates who ask, how will you represent this issue that is important to Indian country in a way that is positive, inspiring and productive? How will you use this platform, meme, infograph, hashtag, et cetera, to bridge campaigns and issue groups? And how will you carry this online energy into offline action through voting, campaign contributions, and volunteerism? So here's a picture of Bethany Yellowtail. That's Bethany sort of in the, the really, um, I don't know what you call that. Is that like a, a caftan? I'm not sure. It's like She has the loose black blouse on with the flowers on it. Bethany Yellowtail, who um, uh, sort of supported the design of these t-shirts, hashtag she represents. And she represents, this is them at the uh, Pueblo Indian Cultural Center in Albuquerque. Um, she represents was a hashtag that was designed or created by Mark Trehant. And Mark is a very well regarded um, uh, journalist covering Indian country, covering Indian country news, you know, and he was the one who sort of raised awareness that, wow, you know, 2018, we have 108 native women running for political office. So what, what do IT professionals say about this balance, right? What does this mean for Indian country? Um, what sort of vulnerabilities do these digital and analog networks of kin bring into our you know, reservations, into our native families and so forth? Maybe some of you saw this episode. In 2019, MTV aired an episode of Catfish in which an 18 year old Navajo and Zuni woman named Maya crafted a social media persona of a single Zuni male to seduce a Navajo single mother named Sherlene into an intimate relationship. The catfisher used an image of Diani Thomas, a young native man who I recognized you know, from a long time ago when I used to live in Seattle. Um, and Diami is a really, um, he's, a, he's an actor, he's a model, he's also a counselor, you know, really interested in native people's wellness. So um, as a native person, it's difficult not to empathize with the various people affected by this fraudulence. It isn't easy for a single mom to find someone special to connect with, especially when living in a town where everyone knows each other or they're related. And it isn't easy for a native teenager to find a safe space to explore their selfhood. And what about Diami, whose image was used as a prop for a psychological scam? No native person wants their image to be appropriated. So IT professionals in Indian country are very conscientious of the dangers of phishing schemes for tribal governments and reservation families. Nowadays, groups and individuals with no personal cybersecurity regimen are the targets of phishing schemes. Phishing schemes happen when an individual uses digital means to grab the attention of a mark who then divulges um, personal information related to banking or other assets to the con. In the case of Shirlene and Maya, the purpose of the phishing scheme stemmed from Maya's unmet psychosocial needs. Yet any IT professional in Indian country will tell you that phishing schemes are something they need to educate tribal employees about as scammers seek profitable tribal government information. At a more sophisticated level of technique, tribal internet networks are also vulnerable to the usual thievery in the informatic underworld. Malware, denial of service attacks, viruses, ransomware, spyware, trolling, and other mechanisms that contribute to identity theft, larceny, illicit data brokering, and in extreme situations, breaches of infrastructure by what the US national secure security community calls foreign adversaries or bad actors. So for a sovereign native nation, any non-tribal person who commits an act of wrongdoing against a tribal person on Indian land is a foreign adversary. We call them colonizers. Yet the shadowy individuals behind phishing schemes and ransomware at attacks need never set foot on Indian land to commit acts of fraudulence and larceny. In 2016, legal scholars Bailey and Cheyenne analyzed scenarios leading to systemic interpersonal violence against First Nations women and girls and found that social media played a part in the bullying, stalking, and grooming behaviors that predicate kidnapping, assault, and suicide. So when it comes to prevention of cybercrime, law enforcement, IT professionals, and social workers alike assert the need for families to monitor their children's and elders' uses of social media and smartphones. IT professionals assert the need for sovereign control of a secure cyber environment through widespread cybersecurity education and network upgrades. So there's a technical aspect to indigenous cyber relationality that relates to allowing someone into a social network, but insisting on firewalls and refusing to disclose personal private information, including home addresses, banking information, social security numbers, and so forth. Um, so this refusal demands technical intervention so this is activists who are conscientious of using virtual private networks for their web browsing, 
uh, those who use encrypted messaging, strong passwords, and those who limit access to devices in the home and the workplace other than for monitored accepted uses. So the guiding questions are, you know, how do you protect your loved ones through your online behaviors? And how do you protect the privacy of your coworkers through your online behaviors? How easy is it for someone to break into your smartphone or your social media account? How easy is it for someone to break into your bank account? So for these reasons, I assert that those information technology professionals who are able to strengthen the information integrity of their tribal nations through persistent cybersecurity and network upgrades, they also contribute to the network sovereignty of their peoples. They keep out the foreign adversaries, those who prey on Indian peoples and lands through digital means. But it is the activists, elders, and culture keepers whose messages of change, ancestral knowing, belonging, and reciprocity create the means for self-determination and self-determination predicates sovereignty. So through their conscientious curation of messaging and images, formal and informal digital archival work, repatriation of knowledge and insistence on healthy boundaries between the simulacra of platform capitalism and our responsibilities to each other within our biomes, they co-create a political will that believes in the historical truth value of capital I, indigeneity, Native rights advocates who work through various institutions pick up on these messages and values and embolden them through political action, from grassroots organizing and direct action to state and federal campaigns designed to shape the structural means through which Native peoples receive services and tribes negotiate with the federal government. As a social scientist and more specifically as an information scientist, I'll be the first to admit that it is methodologically challenging to identify causation and to measure real world impact across these loose networks of humans, devices, and posts or tweets. Perhaps this is because to do so means taking a longitudinal approach or creating narrow proxy definitions of action and impact. It also has, it also requires macro historical sociology, you know, applied to a deep understanding of intertwined indigenous histories. So if you speak to any native person who volunteered for an extended period of time at the water protector camps, you know, through 2016, or who has been distributing supplies through mutual aid, um, the effectiveness of social media toward indigenous goals is apparent. You know, they're not sort of waiting for studies to prove this or that. But what is challenging about social networking sites is how they also make native communities very accessible for colonial acts and behaviors. For the digital activists, there is always the threat of the pretendian, the need to protect oneself against agent provocateurs, corporate blocking and state surveillance. For the tribal elders, there's a threat of loss of life ways as 4G and 5G media ecologies enchant young people away from a deep belonging to their physical terrain. For the cultural knowledge keepers, there's a threat of colonial theft, which is what happens when opportunists exploit meaningful indigenous ways of knowing toward personal profit. For the attorneys, there's a flood of misinformation and disinformation that makes it difficult for judges untrained in federal Indian law or tribal law to hear cases fairly. For the IT experts, each new device in the tribal government introduces a new security risk, and each new device in a native home requires education about privacy and information assurance. For law enforcement, for each new data point that helps locate a missing person, there's a threat of ongoing criminal behaviors, cyber stalking, grooming, phishing schemes. Now, what does indigenous cyber relationality teach us about values of privacy in the United States that is recently realizing its vulnerability to homegrown authoritarianism? That white supremacy is alive and vital to national party politics is nothing new to black folks, native peoples, and many people of color whose ancestral teachings include strategies for survival against this persistent threat. We encode these strategies in our stories. The economic caste system of this country has dispersed most of us, the laboring class or the class meant for extermination, far from our families and homelands. So to share these stories, we use distributed intelligence platforms through which to speak, share, co-create, validate, and learn. Before there was social media, there were phone calls. Before phone calls, there were letters. There are still analog means of sharing, powwow circuits, holiday gatherings, seasonal reunions, and ceremonial obligations. So through these networks designed for intergenerational belonging, longitudinal learning, we built networks of trustworthy kin to cultivate deep listening, the kind that incorporates the entire body and being with a dignified purpose and design. For indigenous peoples in North America, our dignified purpose is not to conquer the natural world through superhuman technocratic advance. Our dignity is in our holism and communal belonging within our living landscapes. So my mother's father was very close to the religious you know, practices of our tribe. And as a child, he survived the 1910 genocide um, in Mexico against Yaqui Indians. As a child, I used to sit near him to hear him speak with my uncles and my aunts and other relatives. And my aunts and mother would tell me where to stand and how to help during those practices. 
And I discern through that, that oral, you call it the oral tradition, right? But I, I discern through that way of being, the meaning in the motion of things, and through that perceive what the dualist cannot, that pain hearkens all other pain, and that though pain sits in the body and spirit of the individual, we empathize through the collective spiritual and political self that is our people. Joy hearkens all other joy and is the cousin of pain. If the deer who is hunted experiences pain, so do we as we were once hunted by people who disregarded the spirit of the natural world in a striving for personal property and money. So still we are hunted and still we care for the animals, plants and beings who are jealously hunted by humans divided from their inherent nature. So as an indigenous thinker who studies digital media, I perceive how our technocratic impulse treats the skies, sunlight, and Earth's embrace as airspace and airwaves, respectively. And over these airwaves, the humans who are divided from their inherent nature corporatize the technical means to communicate digitally over time and space toward instantaneous action, whether among a few or across a collective. Yet unlike in our ceremonies, where through years of practice, we have learned communally as a people when to shift from dispositions of mourning and loss to those of rejuvenation, forgiveness, and joy, this instantaneous mediatized digital action doesn't really have a quality of spiritual release, of welcoming a new cycle in the biome we are sworn to care for. Instead, it has a quality of self-gratification with very little regard for the care of the earth. So when we study the digital traces of a social movement, we have to ask, are we studying the selfie of a movement, how it wants to be seen, how it wants to see itself? And what about the deep roots of a movement, the genealogy of the flesh, the interdependence of mentalities, the infrastructures of a political will and the earth, the territory, the terrain upon which the socio-technical manifestation makes itself heard. Now, these are just notes on aspects of digitally mediated social movements from an indigenous and borderland mentality. For me, indigeneity is not an abstract lens. It is a lived felt experience bearing an ethical responsiveness. It is the energy of thousands of indigenous peoples of technical means in different places around the world who advocate for the well-being and joyful liberation of their people amid the spiritual restoration of the ecologies they are sworn to care for. When I examine the social media traces of indigenous social movements, I perceive how social media platforms generate techniques through which indigenous peoples and individuals carry protocols of respect, belonging, kinship, and shared purpose into digital spheres. This occurs at the level of the infrastructure through tactical repertoires, in decisions about system design values and through command of data flows toward political agenda setting. So in spite of the pervasiveness of the digital divide through Indian country, a preponderance of evidence demonstrates the capacity for native peoples to leverage digital technologies toward political and social ends. And that's the good story that we like to hear. It is one about development and modernization and at times of self-determination. It is about consciousness raising and political mobilization. It is about technical capacity building, about deterring wrongful surveillance, and of restoring indigenous ways of knowing. It's about correcting narratives and truth telling. And though indigenous social media campaigns are not a salvo against a colonial world order, they do light the fire of liberation many of us feel deep inside. So to be a part of these connective action groups feels like justice. It's affirming to share messages and knowledge and to strengthen one's boundaries as a native person, as a family, as a tribe, as a group. And when we insist on our truth value and assert our rights to privacy, whether through tribal government, through the autonomy of indigenous rights collectives, or in our own self-determination, you know, um, we're sort of deciding, you know, who gets to how who gets to determine the future political will, you know, of people who are young, who are not yet born, of those who are coming down, you know, coming down the road. When the colonizer surveils our every action or harms our women or children or arrests our men, they erode our capacity for self-determination. They undercut our autonomy. So this means that for those of you who are not indigenous and yet inspired by the Gestalt, you know, you have to stop and ask yourselves, how are your families related to our families? How will you contribute to the health and wellness of indigenous peoples where you are at? How will you restore the ecological balance of the lands upon which you reside? How will your learning about indigenous ways of knowing contribute to the peoplehood of the original creators and keepers of that knowledge? How will you represent native and indigenous rights you know, in such a way that encourages productive boundary spanning and bridge building across diverse groups? How do you make your choices about online behaviors so that you can protect your vulnerable loved ones and indigenous allies? And how do you contribute to indigenous self-determination? You know, what kinds of privacy rights should we insist on from this federal government now that we are aware of the degree of surveillance that was happening for these groups? So 
because you know as indigenous peoples we experience and you know this you know particular forms of injustice it doesn't mean that that's an anomaly it means that in fact that injustice is occurring across many social groups in the united states it's just that we can see it you know rather immediately and for us you know because of our histories of tribal sovereignty we have a particularly clear view of it so i hope that through this talk you know through sharing we can create space in our hearts and minds to learn from these lessons and we can start thinking about how we can set healthy boundaries as we righteously direct the energy of our digital repertoire. So I'm going to stop sharing and go ahead and turn on my video. And hopefully we can have um, a nice discussion. Thanks. Oh, Katia, yeah, thank you so much, Marissa, uh, for that amazing talk. Um, it was beautiful, complex, illuminating. Um, I just want to encourage everyone, we have this amazing, beautiful audience here. Please express your uh, appreciation for this talk in the chat. And then if you have questions or comments, please put them in the Q&A box and I will uh, read your questions um, as we have now um, about 40 minutes. 40 minutes to continue our conversation. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on a couple things. Uh, one is just a little fun fact, that slide that you showed at the end with the 1491. I forgot to mention that. Should I put it back up really quick? <laughs> well, the reason I want to bring it up is because it was filmed here in Berkeley, uh, Berkeley, <laughs> Albany at uh, the Gathering Tribes uh store they were great michael horse and um, penny were great uh sports about uh, putting that skit together um oh, and so uh yeah comedy has been a great a great um comedies traveled a lot on the internet and in native circles so let's start with that what is the political force of circulating comedic riffs and other kinds of memes and jokes. Um, I guess I'll, I, I had actually imagined I'd have a separate question just for the Baby Yoda meme, <laughs> yeah. but maybe you, we could talk first about the way humor circulates, yeah. its function in relationality and in political mobilization. Um, and here, you know, I'm thinking a lot about um, Vine Deloria's essay on Indian humor and saying no social movement will be successful without humor. So I just want to set up those things. And then if you could also talk about the political and connective force of the baby Yoda meme uh, this past summer. <laughs> yeah, so um, so the, the 1491s, for those of you who, who don't know about the 1491s, they're a native comedy troupe, you know, that started off just making sort of like you know, funny YouTube videos and um, probably in gosh, what, 20, 2009 or 2010 or something like that. And it just kind of like took off. And it just so happens that the folks that are in that group, all the, all the comedians, right? They're multi-talented people, you know, um, they're environmental activists, they're parents, they're um, writers, they are artists, you know, traditional native arts. A lot of them, you know, they have political savvy and, um, and they're just, you know, um, a great group of people. And so um, when I was, one of the first talks that I gave after I finished writing my book was for the Tucson Festival of Books in um, outside of the University of Arizona. And um, Bobby Wilson was there. Um, he's a good friend of my partners. And Bobby Wilson is the guy that in that image, he's, he's shirtless and his long hair is flowing and he's like looking to the future. <laughs> So anyways, but Bobby is Dakota, you know, and, and I mentioned in the talk, I was like, well, let me give a shout out to this Dakota relative here in the audience, you know, and let him know that one of the most inspiring um, historical findings that, you know, helped me to think about um, the uses of native resistance to telecommunications as a form of surveillance was um, when Dakota people would cut the telegraph lines that were allowing early military usage in the Indian Wars during the years of the Indian Wars. And so I brought that up, you know, and and he was like, thanks for the shout out. And I was like, well, definitely, because, you know, that's kind of like what they're doing now with their comedy. Like, you got to be in the in crowd to get it, you know, and there's a lot of coded messaging that's in those jokes. 
And not only does it lighten your heart, so you're not kind of like bogged down with the, with the trauma, frankly, but you know, it also gives us permission to criticize ourselves. One of my favorite episodes that they they give is about, um, I mean, like, well, this episode right now about how the dream catcher will boost your Wi-Fi signal. I mean, that's personally hysterical to me because frankly, like there's a lot of, I spent a lot of time, especially when I was doing the internet connectivity stuff, like just helping my family, like, where's my signal, you know, like going outside, just, that's just very, you know, a mundane thing. And so I had to sort of convince my um, tech colleagues, like, no, this is like radical, like teaching families how to get better Wi-Fi is actually super radical. Um, but one of my favorite sketches that they do is called Indian Man's Anonymous, you know, where they have like a talking circle <laughs> of Indian men who have all these issues, obviously, and, you know, and so they're kind of poking fun at these issues without bringing it up in a traumatic way, you know. So um, I think that what Bobby's doing, you know, what all those guys are doing is they're, they're sort of, um, they're creating this code. They're creating this discourse that allows us to sort of transmit very heavy, intense information, knowledge, you know, in a way that frankly, people, if you're not part of the community, you're not going to see it. You're not going to feel it. You're not going to be strengthened by it. And uh, I don't know if there are, I would have to see, there must be by now, you know, Native scholars who've written about, you know, humor, the humor in, um, you know, Native social media and how that relates to political organizing. But um, there are works, there are black scholars who've done that. So in particular, I'm inspired by Andre Brock who writes about black libidinal joy and black Twitter and how basically you gotta be in the in crowd to get those jokes because otherwise you're not gonna get it. And why are you laughing? You know, so like the phenomenon of the clap back and all this kind of stuff, it makes you look back at yourself and think, why am I laughing? Ouch, you know, <laughs> that hurts too good or oh my gosh, I'm a terrible person or, you know, whatever. So I think that is, I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I will mention that when I do social um, in our in the pre previous studies that I've done with Dr. Vigil Hayes and with Nicola Dashini Parkhurst on social media, you know, one of the things that we have taken a look at is media richness. So which tweets get carried further across these this, the Twitter sphere, and the ones that do are the ones that have um, images, videos, and uh, kind of like what we call rich media attached to it. And that's kind of like with the Baby Yoda thing, like there's not very many words, right? But the image says it all, you know, whether it's beadwork Yoda, baby Yoda, or it's, um, you know, baby Yoda drinking, you know, this thing where he's like this, like just watching, I'm gonna cuss, I'm gonna backwards cuss, watching Ish go down, you know? <laughs> it's just like, if you're colonial, you're just kind of always like that, like what's happening now, you know? Okay, like I can handle it. So, um, but yeah, like I, I'll just really quick, like, I mean, this is my view on the baby Yoda thing is that yes, we claim baby Yoda as being a little native baby, little native kid, you know, who's just sort of taken into adventures that probably no baby should be in, <laughs> that no child should be in, you know, and yet, you know, he's tough, he survives, he has these super, superpowers, you know, to bend space and time. It's like he's belongs to this um, ancestry that is um, just sort of indefatigable, you know, and um, so, yeah, that's that's my view on Baby Yoda and why, you know, we're like, oh, check it out. Jedi's are natives. You know, I knew that. I felt it. I felt it. I've always been against the Empire. So that's my take on that. I don't know. <laughs> that's such a wonderful um, response to those questions. Um, I'm going to turn now to uh, some of the questions that have come up in um, the uh, Q&A box. Um, so. The first question says, um, thank you for this amazing presentation. Could you please share your thoughts, perspectives on if and how non-Indigenous Native people should approach or, and or use the sharing of Indigenous slash Native knowledge posted via social media, um, particularly promoting and sharing it through scholarship, academia, and activism, even if it's posted uh, publicly respecting and honoring its sacredness, giving true credit, et cetera? I mean, I think that, um, I think that you might already know the answer to that. You know, um, one thing like is to use this critical literacy skills, right? And this is uh, anti-racist critical literacy skills too. So am I sharing something that has stereotypes worked into it? You know, so um, you, you'll see these things in like gift shops, right? Like. Um, it'll be a candle that says something like be good. And then underneath it, it says ancient Cherokee 
proverb or something like that. So I mean, we see memes like that too, and that's not really helpful, right? Um, but nowadays, there is there's there's a lot of great information and knowledge out there that Native peoples have created themselves, and um, it's this is going back to our basic sort of information literacy practices, right? It's like okay, who is producing this information? Has it been vetted? Is it of a good quality? You know, um, so is it through say an, uh, an American Indian Studies Department that created like some sort of online tool? Is it from a tribal museum or some other museum that has, you know, come to a reciprocal agreement with an, a native or indigenous community? You know, is it through a group like a political advocacy group that is well regarded? You know, and um, frankly, if you don't know the answer, you don't have to share it, right? Like if you know the answer and you feel solid about it, you can share it, right? I mean, native native peoples, um, you know, um, we sort of make our own. This is something that I've discovered through the course of all this kind of work is that native peoples very carefully tend to vet things, you know, even though it looks a little bit haphazard, they're like, oh yeah, that's my cousin, you know, that looks haphazard, but that, oh yeah, that's my cousin really means a lot actually, you know, <laughs> and like, oh yeah, that's my old professor. Or, oh yeah, that, I know that, you know, I went to school with that person or we went to Haskell together or whatever, or I know his grandma, you know, those things mean a lot. And uh, for the non-native community, that isn't necessarily a case. You're not part of those networks. So, so I think, I mean, I appreciate, um, I really, again, I'm drawing inspiration from Andre Brock's work, you know, from Meredith Clark, who's also um, a journalist, a uh, professor of journalism and who studies black social media, black Twitter. You know, I really appreciate what they say, which is like, look, if you're not black, you can't be part of black Twitter. Like you can watch it, you know, and maybe you're gonna repost and stuff, but you're not really in it, you know? And it's, I, I, I very much perceive that dynamic with, with the native with native stuff too. You can share it, you know, but um, it's gonna take a certain, um, depth of meaning when it gets circulated through indigenous networks and so there's there's that's not a bad thing i think that's a great thing and i really appreciate it when i see stuff bubble across my network from non-native relatives and friends and so forth because um, i'm like oh they see us you know they they see us how we want to be seen you know and they think that what we think is cool is is cool there too you know uh thank you that's um awesome uh so we have two questions that seem that seem connected they're both about um internet infrastructure so um one of them comes from carrie hot and the other from teria smith uh carrie uh, says thank you first that was so wonderful i'm interested in hearing more about your perspectives um particularly in terms of how physical internet infrastructure impacts local environments and contributes to carbon emissions overall. So has that been a facet of your work? The question have, from Terry, oh, sorry. The question no, go ahead, from Terry is uh, how do you anticipate, oh, what do you anticipate are the long-term ramifications for those in tribal communities? And here I want to you know, point out that a lot of communities are, are rural um, who are without internet access. So those two uh, infrastructure questions. Yes, and they're related. So, you know, thank you for pairing those because they're very related. So, okay, so um, I'm gonna, so this is a mixed audience. So I'll, I'll try to um, sort of explain this in a, um, a way that can um, satisfy the um, basic knowledge of both groups. So internet infrastructure, right? Um, first of all, it's not just sort of out there. It's very much, um, it's a construction project, it's an installation project, and it's multi-millions of dollars. And usually one has to, for a community to get internet infrastructure, especially if they're an underserved rural community, they have to um, generate through capital investments, you know, um, 17 million, 25 million, 50 million to get connected. And that's a lot of memoranda of agreement, rights of way, easements. Um, as you know how it is with any construction project, it's like you, you've got a calendar and then something happens, you know, there's a, a major windstorm and people can't work or, an economic downturn, you know, these things affect um, deployment. And when it comes to environmental concerns, as far as an Indian country, it really varies. So for those tribes that have command over, let's call it their uh, territory and attention to their biome, you know, maybe they usually have, if it's, if it's sovereign Indian land, they usually have their own environmental impact assessment that satisfies the federal impact um, assessment requirements 
but that might go a step further, you know, either because they have their own protocol of respect for environmental stewardship or because they have the own particularities of that terrain to work with, or because it's folded into the requirements of the traditional historic preservation officer who's also on the lookout for things like sacred sites, you know, um, um, and things like that. Certain plants that are, you know, only grow in a certain place for medicinal purposes and things like that. So building out on sovereign federal Indian land where they have a very um, demanding um, environmental impacts assessment is gonna take a longer time. And the design of those towers, you know, the cell towers and so forth might be shaped by that. So they're, they're, they're not gonna operate on the urban sprawl model, which is like, let's just build it. Nobody looks there anyways, you know, it's just another warehouse. It's just another data center, whatever, you know, it's just real estate. For natives, it's like, okay, you can build here, but it can only be according to these dimensions. It can't cut across the sky. You know, it can't disturb um, this particular grove of trees or something like that. So that that's one way. Another way of thinking about this though, and one that I've been contending with lately, and quite frankly, I'm not quite sure how to study this yet, is the rollout of 5G, right? So right now, most of us are using, if you're in an urban place, and I think, you know, folks in Berkeley, probably are in this situation, but you have 4G, you're probably using 4G networks. So it's relatively fast. You know, you can sort of watch Netflix while you're listening to this lecture and also be chatting with your friend and maybe your kids are in the other room like watching Disney or something. It's like you can, it's very media rich and intense and um, there's not a lot of latency, which means, you know, when it gets sort of, the screen gets sort of jiggly. Um, and the idea is that, you know, with 5G that that latency would be improved through various technical means. One idea is that it could be improved through sort of improvements in the way that information travels through fiber optic networks. And that would require um, putting towers much closer together. So in some places they're talking about towers or receivers and so forth that are like 25 feet apart, you know? And if you live, if you're native and you live in rural parts of Indian country, like towers 25 feet apart is just not a reality for us. That's just not a reality. Like literally the terrain doesn't allow for it or our the way that we respect the land in our space doesn't allow for it, like no way. Or I mean, frankly, we just can't afford that. And here is where we get the story of the digital divide, which is that the, e the economic drivers of this, that is the cities, the urban centers are what sort of propels this demand for 5G, right? For these new improvements, technical uh, deployments but they do not put money back into, the tax base money does not go back into the rural parts of that state, whether you're tribal or not, you know, and it especially does not go <laughs> into the so federal sovereign Indian land, you know, or to areas bordering B BLM land where there's low population density. And so, so what that means, I mean, this is a real critical issue for Indian country, especially for folks who, you know, as you know now, um, you know, we've got stories of people in Indian country who, because of COVID-19, you know, kids can't, be, are they're not keeping up with their school lessons online. You know, the school gave them Google Chromebooks, but those don't work really well unless you're plugged into the internet, you know, or unless you do a lot of planning ahead. So we really, I think, gotta be thinking in Indian country and beyond about some sort of um, state funds or federal funds that will help our students to catch up, our K-12 students to catch up, you know, for these potentially a year and a half away from school, you know, you know, even if they've been doing really great stuff with, you know, decolonial learning or homeschooling, de-schooling, you know, the fact is like um, the pace is sort of set by the urban centers that have connectivity and access. And um, it's really hard to, um, it's really hard to sort of be an advocate when you're you know, living in a rural place. So that that's that's my thoughts on that. I can, I can kind of go on about that a bit more, but I think maybe we should try to make room for another direction. Okay, oh, thank you. That was uh, such a wonderful um, explanation. Um, I am gonna take us in another direction. Um, we have a, que uh, a question from Ashley Thompson. Uh, um, Ashley begins by saying, amazing lecture, Dr. Duarte. I am grateful social media has allowed me to connect with other natives, as well as my people now that I live far from my homelands. It's also an essential aspect of organizing movements and drawing attention to our issues. Yet, I've also seen and fell prey to the destructive side of social media, such as online harassment, stalking, and bullying. Um, and th these are elements um, 
from your talk too. And what are your thoughts on how we can protect ourselves from its more harmful effects? How do we cultivate respect in cyber communities? Meg, which? So this is a challenging question because, um, so I also teach justice theory, right? And, um, you know, in theory, when somebody engages in an act of wrongdoing or somebody makes a claim of that harm has been done to them, you know, um, there needs to be sort of an evaluation of all the facts, you know, in, in the sense of like, what is the nature of the wrongdoing and what is the nature of the harm? And I bring this up because of the situation with um, Red Wolf Pope, right? Um, for some people, you know, um, cyber stalking or, or, or cyber harassment can be like, a, I, I saw something uh, probably, oh gosh, this was maybe like four years ago. Um, um, my friend, Nanaba Beck, she's a, a very talented silversmith and artist. Um, she has a, um, a uh, Instagram site, you know, for her art, for her, her jewelry and her art. And she posted a picture of, um, I think it was, she was with her family and they were, they were doing traditional sheep butchery, you know, and she got some people on there who were like haters, you know, who were saying this is animal cruelty and all this kind of stuff. And, but the image, the image that the story that she was trying to tell was about, you know, um, ancestral Navajo practices, you know, of sheep butchery and how that brings the family together. It was a picture of herself and it's specifically about matrilineal ways of knowing, you know, and respect. And so this person's kind of rude comments and then other people sort of chimed in on that were sort of like, you know, kind of like really off base, you know, from, yeah. And so um, none of us had to do this work to sort of correct that, right? And, and to, to some extent, yes, it's, it, it feels like harassment, right? Because it's like you're getting trolled and then all of a sudden, boom, 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 like three more people come on and then, you know, you're worried, like, are people going to take this the wrong way? Do I need to take the post down? And you go through this, like, thinking, and then it triggers all this trauma about being rendered voiceless as a Native woman and how we are depicted as savages, right? And that, you know, we're dehumanized for that, right? And so you have to deal with that as well. So when you're laying out what is the nature of the harm, it's like, well, what is the nature of the harm? Is it psychological? Is it emotional? Is it uh, physical? Is it, what is the nature of the harm, right? And then out of that, it's deciding what is the nature of the justice that will correct that harm? You know, so, you know, in some cases it's like, okay, we can, I can handle this. I can take it on, you know, I can address this. And so if I can direct um, attention to the comments, I can use this as a learning moment. You know, I can make a decision to practice boundaries for myself, you know, um, but in a case like Red Wolf Pope, you know, where he had recordings of himself, you know, engaging in um, these, you know, criminal and wrongful acts with women, you know, that required this another level of intervention. You know, it needed to be leveled up. So when it comes to these kind of situations, I think that it's very, very important for Native peoples when they practice sort of um, protecting themselves and their boundaries is to be conscientious of the law, you know, and not to self isolate when these things occur. You know, um, there is such a thing as a Native Women's Whisper Network, you know, in which we sort of, we kind of look out for each other, you know, and um, you know, you can call a friend from that you maybe haven't spoken to in 10 years and say, hey, this happened. What do you think? And they're like, oh, I knew it. You know, <laughs> it's just they validate and confirm and you can sort of collectively work toward dealing with that wrongdoing, whether it's through like, um, you know, an interpersonal process of healing someone's heart or if it's something that does require some sort of criminal, you know, uh, intervention through law enforcement or something like that. Right. So um so that's my sort of response to that. I think it is, it's, it's not um, sort of, you know, I know that I've sort of painted this in broad strokes, but it's really important to pay attention to the nature of the wrongdoing, you know, and to, and to raise awareness of it with trusted interpersonal network to sort of um, do the background um, work on that. Yeah, I hear in that answer too, this uh, sort of return to um, the structures of care um, that can work through um, technology and um, there's a there's a question that I think builds on that a little bit. Um, this is from Aaron Gregory, and it, the question is: To what extent can we situate indigenous cyber relationalities with the notion of making kin with machines? Uh, see Jason Edward Lewis, Noelani Arista, Archer Pachawis, and uh, Suzanne Kite. 
So I've kind of um, tangled that with that a little bit in different ways. And I keep coming back to sort of some of the same some of the same epistemic problems, um, which is that, um, you know, you know, for Native peoples, what is the machine made out of? You know, this goes back to the environment question before, right? Which is like, you know, what are the, what sort of earth had to be disrupted to make this cell phone that I'm carrying around everywhere? You know, um, whose lives were put at risk in the making, in the crafting of this thing, you know? And, um, so I, you know, I, I keep coming back to that. And I'm also sort of disturbed by um, a quote that I hope that I've misinterpreted from Donna Haraway's um, recent book on, I see it on the shelf, but I can't, I don't remember the title right now about the Anthropocene in which she says, you know, it's time to pay attention to those who, um, she uses sort of metaphors that are related with uh, the, like a, a swamp sort of like um, with those who wriggle and, and squirm and those who are, you know, in the pond that are in the deep. Essentially, she was trying to say um, people whose feet are on the ground, indigenous peoples, you know, grassroots type stuff, and people who are close to caring for the earth. And I kind of took issue with that um, because of the, first of all, exoticization of indigenous struggle, um, but also because, you know, what do you mean it's time to take, pay attention? We've been talking about this for a really long time. You know, you can't build the United States. You cannot industrialize the United States without paying attention to the, the balance of, you know, the ecological balance, the biome of things. Like, what are you doing if you do that? And, um, and we see that now, you know, but I think that we are in this, the environmental crisis, I really do think, is sort of more of a crisis of these te technicized, technologically, sort of informed human beings to sort of reorient back to their belonging to the soil, to clean water, to clean air, you know, to the, I mean, there was a time when you could drink from springs, you know, and those times are just replete in native people's knowledge and our, our ways of surviving. So that's sort of my thought on that, as far as making kin with the machine. I much prefer the work of uh, Max Liberant who's a very talented scholar from, um, coming out of University of Newfoundland, whose new book, I think is called uh, Plastic is Colonization. I think it'll be coming out this year, 2021. And she writes about how it is when you are, um, she studies plastics in the oceans and distribution of, you know, they, they, they become these tiny particles that then sea animals ingest and then they get, go up the food chain and, and it just affects everything, right? In a negative way. And she writes about how when you're, you know, in through her study, sh she's looking at things and realizing like this plastic, these bits of plastic that are, I, I, I don't think of as alive, but I've made them. I'm a human being and we have made them. And so we're responsible for taking care of them, just like we would care for maybe a relative who's not like the greatest human being, <laughs> who's not such a good person, right? You, you it's your responsibility to educate, to care, to provide compassionate, you know, adjustment, right? Correction when necessary um, uh, to this thing, this bit of plastic, you know, it's time to take responsibility for that. So that's my thought on that. I think that if we want to sort of think about environmental responsibility and sort of, you know, 5G and the, our, our cell phones and our desires for like faster, super rich, you know, media as you know, we have to really think about, you know, am I willing to plant several trees, a small forest for the cell phone? And I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of not, you know, I, that's not built into my day-to-day -day life, but it really should be. So that's my, that's my thoughts on that. Um, well, actually, I'm, there are a couple of questions that uh, are um, asking uh, more about these environmental, um, how to advocate um, environmentally. Uh, through the technology itself. So one of them comes from Karina and the other one is from um, Marcelo. So uh, Karina uh, Sarvia Butler asks, how can we leverage internet technologies so that the eagle, Quetzal and condor fly together for planetary restoration? And Marcelo um, Garzo asks, well, first um, acknowledges uh, this amazing um, talk saying, uh, thank you, Professor Duarte, for bringing everything you have here with such clarity and power. My question is around cyber relationality and land, territory, place. 
You mentioned this at certain points, but could you talk more about how indigenous engagements with tech are remembering or reconnecting those who have been dislocated or displaced from traditional lands and territories? So I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the eagle and the condor first. And I'll tell you a, a, a personal story about that because that, that prophecy <clears throat> has very much informed my work from the very beginning. So, um, so I'm, I'm Yaki, right? Uh, my tribe is binational. Our, uh, our um, autonomous zone is in Sonora, which is you know uh, the Northern state of Mexico on the West coast. And then we have a uh, federally recognized land in Tucson, Arizona. So Mexico and the United States. And some people sort of call that border, the US Mexico border, even though Mexico is part of North America, they tend to think of Mexico as the beginning of Latin America, right? And so, um, so I've always sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm native, you know, I'm Yaki, but I'm, I have a lot to identify with ethnically with, with Mexico and with Latin America and, um, and with Mesoamerica. And so the prophecy of the condor just really struck home for me, the eagle and the condor in 2012, in December of 2012, on December 22nd, 2012. And I wrote about it in my book because I think when I was 14, Leslie Ar Marmon Silko's book, Almanac of the Dead came out. I think it was 1994, so I was about 14. And I read that book um, and it's about, there's a central figures in it who are Yaki. I've never seen Yaki uh, women writ written about by you know, authors before in a way that felt realistic, you know, that felt real to me. So Leslie Marmon Silko writes about this Almanac of the Dead that these Yaki children are sort of escaped north and they're responsible for carrying this Almanac. And through the book, the mystery is, well, what is the Almanac, right? And for me, it was plainly clear, you know, for Yaki people, we have, uh, a book of the dead, every family has one. It's literally a book that we is wrapped in black cloth and it has the names of all those who have passed. And we remember them every year, you know, it's, it's part of our, because, you know, it's death is a transition for us. Um, but in that remembering, we're also remembering our history where we've been and where we're going and there's a prophetic quality to it, you know? Um, so in December 22nd, 2012, I was super aware that this is a key date on, on the, for the Mayan day keepers on the calendar, it's a shift. On that date, I happened to be, I happened to open my um, laptop and I was kind of scanning Facebook for native news because it's not like you can turn on CNN and get native news. <laughs> and at least not at that time, it's still not really today. But I saw, um, I don't know, more marches just going in full blast on that day. And that same day there were marches in, um, the Zapatistas were engaging in major marches against um, neoliberal president Peña Nieto. And I just felt like I was holding two worlds at that point you know, one in each hand, but they were not speaking to each other because one is largely Spanish speaking and one is English speaking. And so I personally felt at that moment, like these networks, you know, are extraordinarily important for allowing for this translative moment to occur, you know, so that we can have transnational solidarity. Maybe these moment, movements do not speak to each other because of linguistic difference, because of different cultural references, but there are key people in the world who can speak these two languages and bring them together. And they do all the time, you know, and we've been doing that for a long time. One of the major um, sort of people who I would speak to when I was writing about building internet in, uh, networks in Indian country was um, Paul Chavez. He's the um, father of uh, Dana Arviso, who's a, a good friend, you know, and her s sister Tazba Chavez, Tazba Rose. And um, I used to, when I was a grad student, I was living in a house that Paul owned in the Seattle area with four other native women. It was just like wonderful. But I would talk to him about this. He's, he's Bishop Paiute and he's also Apache and Yaki as well. And he would, he would say like, yeah, man, I mean, these networks have, we've been engaging in trade networks since the beginning of time, you know? And he would just lay out these things for me in a way that I really needed to hear and to just understand that these telecommunication networks are just sitting on top of those existing trade networks, it's just that only some of us know how to navigate them, you know, through discourse, through humor, through art, through poetry, through be, being able to read Leslie Marmon Silko's work and reading it um, as prophetic, you know, and, and not just as a work of literature. So, um, so that's my response to that. I think that they're extraordinarily important for continuing that work. I think that there is an extra challenge for those who do that work because you literally are um, multilingual, multicultural, and have to constantly shift ways of being depending on where you're at through the indigenous world. Um, 
yeah, so I think that's that's my response to that. And then the second question was on indigenous cyber relationality and land territory environment. Yes, I'll uh, repeat the sort of core of it. Um, could you talk more about how indigenous engagements with tech are remembering or reconnecting those who have been dislocated or displaced from traditional lands and territories? Yeah, this is extraordinarily important. And I think it really hit hope. So I grew up pretty close to my tribes. Um, uh, I feel pretty close to my tribe's traditions. I always felt like if I had a question about our history or, or language or whatever, I could just turn to one of my aunties, you know, and it's just a phone call away or a visit away. But that's not the case for many Native peoples. And this really hit home for me uh, when I was in um, in uh, the Northeast. I went to go visit some, you know, up there in the Northeast at Amherst College. And I was looking at the books, so they they got a collection of two over 2000 native authored books that they wanted to digitize and these were going back to like I, I want to see like mid 18th century or so and. Um, and I happened so there's a reason I chose Marge to highlight Marge Bruchak's work in this lecture, you know we were all in the archive looking at the paper versions of the books that they were going to digitize and make available for their digital collection and I. I was sort of eavesdropping on Marge Bruchak. <laughs> she's like this, like she's one of my heroes, you know, as a historian, as a native scholar. And I was kind of looking at some other um, items and she was right here talking with two other colleagues and she was going through this book by Samson Occam. And she was looking, she was reading in the marginalia, just kind of sketched in the marginalia were these sort of marks. And she was actually interpreting the meaning of those marks and was able to fill it with this just lush history you know, that's from her understanding of that part of the world, you know, and, you know, her family are just known, you know, story workers, culture keepers, all this kind of stuff. And I was just blown away because it just, I mean, that's just how Marge is. If you ever get a chance to work with Dr. Bruchak, that's just how she is, you know, I mean, she just tells stories that have this, um, this quality that makes you realize this is the way the world is, you know, it's not, it's not MTV Catfish, it's not CNN. You know, it's not Facebook. This is the way the world is. It things just seem to speak to your way of being at different levels. And um, listening to Marge Bruchak made me realize that you know, a lot of times we want to emphasize. We want we think up new digital tools. We think that the tools, you know, the digital techniques are what's bringing our people home, but they are just the means to which you know educators like Marge Bruchak, story workers, can do the true work because that work needs to happen when a person's heart is open and ready, you know, when they're ready to do the deep listening and ready to take responsibility for those stories. So even now, while I'm telling you this, I cannot tell you what Marge Rochek said about Samson Ankham. I don't remember. And I don't have any, I don't have the intellectual structures, the pre-existing architecture to be like, oh yeah, that was in 1767, that happened. And then in 1820, I don't know, you know, that's, that's not in my history. I'd have to study it. But what spoke to me about it, you know, was how it made me feel and how it opened my heart and how it made me realize, okay, it's not about the book. It's about Dr. Bruchak and, and her as a human being and her family and how she's carrying on this powerful story. So um, yes, I think it's important to digitize indigenous knowledge. As long as we empower, you know, we do this with understanding how our, our native story keepers, our culture keepers are going to be able to use it. It's for them to carry forward. You know, they're the ones who carry the seeds forward. We can access it all we want. And that's kind of actually our weakness as academics is that when we don't know something, we just look it up. We don't take time to think deeply about, you know, what it means as far as our sense of humanity and dignity. I mean, that's why we need you, Beth. I mean, that's what you help us do through your writing. And, you know, it's helping us to like stop, think, okay, you know, this is not just a citation in a paper. This is not just, you know, a, a poem that I read while I'm, I'm bored. You know, this is a way of being. So that's that's my thought on that. That's really beautiful, and uh, you know, thinking about reconnecting to lands and territories, it's been really um, inspiring to me, also as a language worker, to see how technology has been so important in um, uh, supporting language revitalization, and and actually this this idea of the remix, where um, you know, pulling pulling ancestral voices out of archives and then singing with ancestors again. Um, that's been a really, and, and speaking with them, storytelling with them 
uh, has been a really deep, um, profound uh, movement within indigenous um, language revitalization. Um, so I want to give uh, someone from our audience the last question here, um, because it, this question is also about, um, we've been talking so much about building communities and working across uh, spaces. And this question is um, from Virginia McLaurin, um, who asks, in terms of public education and indigenous, non-indigenous relations, with apps like TikTok and Twitter that allow non-Indigenous people to interact with Indigenous people and in somewhat direct ways like response posts and messaging, do you believe that this will result in meaningful reduction in stereotypes and colonialist attitudes from non-Indigenous young people who are growing up now in this digital environment? That's a great question. I mean, this, um, so, uh, Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. I think of it in a couple of registers. One, I think about the work of um, Stephanie Freiberg, you know, who's a professor of psychology, I, I believe psychology at, um, I think she's at, is she still at University of Washington? Washington. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, her research has, you know, so um, I'm, you know, you, please forgive me, Dr. Freiberg. <laughs> I'll just tell everybody, go read her work for yourself, but I'm gonna sort of just like super sort of describe it. but. You know, in her work, she was showing images of college students, you know, who come from a, a number of backgrounds, you know, um, sort of stereotype images of Indians, right? So, so like Indians as they were depicted in like the 1960s and 70s cowboy and Western shows, and things like that, right? <clears throat> and what she found was that, um, you know, um, white students would feel, there was a portion of white students who would feel sort of a, um, a sense of empowerment when they saw those images. You know, whereas natives, when they saw them, sort of always, it was traumatizing. It was a sense of negative self-identity and, and things like that, right? Um, and and even when the, you know, you, there was an intervention, so somebody giving a lesson or somebody saying, look, these images are racist and they're not right, you know, they and, the, and you have students who'd say, yes, yes, we, we can see that. Yeah, it's wrong, totally wrong, you know? <laughs> they would still register a feeling of empowerment looking at it. And this study is really important because it points at um, a psychology that in this country we call whiteness, but again, this is the eagle and the condor. In other countries in Latin America, you know, whiteness is about elitism, right? So it's not necessarily, they're not white, you know, um, Mexico's elite are not white per se, but they exert a sense, can exert a sense of um, superiority over indigenous peoples of Mexico or indigenous peoples, any part of Latin America. And so it raises questions that are um, tied to caste, you know? And if one is, and I'll, I'll reference here if you haven't read it yet, Isabel Wilkerson's um, important book on caste, but um, you know, if a person is born into believing that they are um, superior, it's really hard to undo that thinking, even when one tries. And one can pay it lip, lip service, one can intellectualize how to undo it, but if it's so psychologically ingrained, ingrained, it's it's just it's a it's a it takes a great deal of effort. So yes, it's important for native peoples to um, circulate their own stories and images through TikTok, and especially if they're like positive and um, you know um, you know productive and helpful and in the right spirit. I'll, I'll put this with you know in the right spirit of things um, according to these concepts of indigenous cyber relationality. Is it going to affect the inner colonial mentalities of people, of native people? I hope so. If they have mentorship, face-to-face -face mentorship. I mean, this is what Dr. Simpson, Leanne Simpson is saying that we need, we still need the matriarchs around them, giving them guidance on how to be in the right way, you know? You know, um, is it going to affect how non-native peoples view uh, native peoples? I'm not sure. I really don't know. It depends on where they are in the caste system. You know, if they're um, committed to the upper caste, you know, um, I'm, I'm really not sure if they're not prone to self-awareness, to introspection, if they are not a systems thinker who understands that, you know, justice is uh, a matter of justice for all, you know, it's, it's what is, what is it, the network of the mutual network of our destiny, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put it, you know, they can't perceive that if they don't live by that code, then, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, it's maybe just something amusing. So, um, but yeah, I, once again, I'll just go back to the topic of comedy. This is why we have coded jokes, right? <laughs> 
and I was, I mean, I heard one the other day by this, um, I can't remember her name, but she's just on fire right now. She's a, a comedian. She's a white woman out of LA, right? And I saw her on something the other day. I can't remember what, might've been the history of cursing on Netflix. And she was talking about the, the B word. So I'm not going to cuss because, you know, I don't know if you have little ones who are listening or something like that, your values on cursing, but um, the history of the B word. And she's pretending that she gets her DNA test, you know, and it says that she's like 30% B, 10% W-H-O-R-E, you know, X percent S-L-U-T and oh, 20% Cherokee. Wow. You know, <laughs> it's just like, it's hilarious. You know, she can see like she's without getting into it. She's pointing at this fundamental um, uh, wrongness, injustice of, of being native that we're at one point both desirable and yet a slur, you know? So anyways, I'll, I guess I'll answer it. Laughing on a good, uh, ending on a good laugh is the right way to end our time together. Um, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. And I just want to thank the audience for being here. And again, please uh, send your love notes to um, our professor uh, tonight in the chat. Uh, gratitude and praise and honor for such a rich um, evening together. Thank you so much. Katsu, yeah, yeah.